Tubbs is a man who he builds amplifiers, repair anything electrical, build anything electrical. But Tubbs was a genius in recording with effects, you know? Tubbs was a man like that. Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. If you've ever heard similar instrumentals to what was played in the clip that you just watched of the guys rocking out at that sound system dance, then it means you've listened to the captivating creation of the great Osborne Ruddock, aka King Tubby. This legendary producer, electronics engineer and creator of one of the sub-genres of reggae music which we now know as dub reggae or simply dub. In a nutshell, dub is the electronic offspring of roots reggae and is essentially remixing instrumentals of existing tracks, stripping down vocals and adding special effects like echoes, reverbs and delays. King Tubby's incredible creation not only shook reggae music to its very foundations, but it's very important to note that dub would actually form the template for electronic music since the 1970s with dub DNA at the heart of hip-hop, house music, techno, electronic dance music and sub-sub-genres like dubstep. I think King Tubby's importance in reggae music is criminally underreported. This genius of a man wasn't always a producer in the conventional sense but more of a studio mixing engineer per excellence. His outrageous talent would see him elevate the role of mixing from a purely functional one to a super creative art form and would transform the mixing console from its default use to a powerful instrument. While producers in Jamaica are one of the most criticized groups of people in the reggae scene, it's almost impossible to find anybody who had a bad word to say about King Tubby, the dub master. He not only helped to create some of the greatest performers in reggae history, but would also bequeath his wizardry to his apprentices, some of whom would become the greatest producers in reggae music history, before he was taken out of this world in cruel circumstances. His influence is simply unreal and needs to be talked about. Now without further ado, let's take a look at King Tubby, the electronic wizard that created dub. Osborne Ruddock was born on January 28, 1941 and would grow up on Holborn Street in downtown Kingston with his three brothers and one sister. But in the early 1950s, he would move with his mother to 18 Dramilly Avenue in the Penwood section of the Waterhouse area, a place he would call home for the rest of his life. And it was at Waterhouse that he was given the nickname of Tubby because his mother was a great admirer of then Liberian president Sir William Tubman. He was an unusually bright kid with an uncanny level of interest in electronics. His keen love for gadgets and how they worked led him to study electronics at the College of Arts, Science and Technology in Uptown Kingston. But that was not enough for young Toby, as his geek credentials were to be further bolstered by several correspondence courses that he would take from several institutions in the USA after bagging his diploma. His favorite hobby was building radios from discarded parts that he would salvage from rubbish dumps. And not long after, the teenager would open an electronics repair shop. He started out repairing people's radios, televisions, and other household appliances, and in no time started building amplifiers for the various sound system operators whose popularity was literally exploding by then. Toby built so many sound systems that by the mid-1970s, he was estimated to have built more than two-thirds of the sound system equipment in Jamaica. In 1958, at just 17, he would establish one for himself, which he would name King Toby's hometown hi-fi. And that became his first foray into the music business, which he would transform and revolutionize with his irresistible sound. He never intended to go into the sound system business in a major way and was content to just play local venues in his area of Waterhouse. But the awesome sound quality that Toby's hometown hi-fi brought to the table was pure delight for his listeners and that outfit's popularity was skyrocket in no time. King Toby would become revered as a technical and sound system genius in his neighborhood and that fame would attract the adulation of a 10-year-old boy named Lloyd James. This kid also lived on Dromilly Avenue and had a keen interest in electronics and King Toby would take this kid under his wing and make him an apprentice, firstly as an electronic technician and later studio engineer and producer that would eventually go by the name Prince Jammy, an eventual legend in his own rights. When the 1960s unfolded, King Toby would build his own radio transmitter and began to run the pirate radio station 
that specialized in playing ska that exploded in popularity at the start of that decade. But it would quickly shut it down when the Jamaican authorities dispatched a task force team of soldiers and crack police detectives to find the source. Apparently, the broadcast frequency was so powerful that it was affecting Jamaican government broadcast radio signal. He would redirect his attention to his repair shop, amplifier building, and sound system businesses. And in no time, a chance encounter would take his sound system from a decent waterhouse outfit to a national sensation. One evening in 1967, King Toby was walking by a street where a sound system called Sir George the Atomic was playing. There were lots of sound systems all over Kingston, but what caught Toby's attention that night was the amazing performance of that outfit's DJ who was spitting fire on the microphone. He would go to that dance and approach the young toaster whose name was Ewart Beckford but went by the stage name of Uroy and invited him to come and check out his sound system over at Waterhouse. Uroy obliged him and went over to see what was going on and when he heard the powerful high quality sound, he immediately made up his mind to join that sound system as resident DJ. Uroy's superb toasting ability characterized by his expert timing, witty lyrics and unrivaled swagger helped to propel that sound system from Waterhouse alone to all over Kingston and indeed the whole of Jamaica itself. But by 1968, Toby's genius would totally change the game and take everything to a whole new level. Around that time, he was doing work for producer Duke Reed of Treasure Isle Records, creating instrumental versions of existing songs. Toby's job was simply to use the faders on the mixing consoles to remove the vocals on those songs. But his electronic wizardry would have him add sound effects like echoes of parts of the vocals, reverbs and delays, effectively using the mixing board as some sort of instrument. He loved how it sounded and decided to introduce those same effects to the music he was playing at the sound system, employing his unique chrome fronted amplifier. And everywhere he tested this groundbreaking system, the crowd would simply lose their minds and began to follow his sound system everywhere it played in Jamaica. Now, combine Uroy's brilliant toasting with this awesome innovation and what you get is a musical match made in heaven. And it was at Toby's hometown hi-fi that Uroy would become a national and eventually global superstar. By 1971, Toby having conquered the sound system scene, he would take the next step in his evolution as a musical force when he decided to open a mixing studio of his own. Producer Bonnie Lee helped him acquire a four-track mixing desk from the popular Dynamic Sound Studio. That mixing console in question was an old and obsolete piece of equipment. But Toby, doing what he did best, would upgrade and tweak it and made it a powerful tool through which he would create a new subgenre of reggae music. Anytime Toby would get a client who would need an instrumental version, he would unleash his innovation of delays, reverbs and echoes to their incredible delights. And in no time, practically every hot and upcoming independent producer in Jamaica was knocking at Toby's studio door to get their own share by the King Toby treatment. It was his dub sound that would help to make those young producers eventual superstars and legends. And some of these men included Naini the Observer, Lee Scratch Perry, Yabi Yu and Augustus Pablo and the whole of Jamaica would get the introduction to dub music when King Toby booked the radio station for one hour during which he only played dub music and would stun an entire island and in no time, dub would catch fire all over Jamaica and needless to say, style exploded in popularity and by the mid-1970s, dub tracks and even dub albums were in huge demand overseas. As Toddy's clouds and studio fortunes kept growing, he would upgrade his studio to include recording facilities and employ the number of gifted upcoming studio sound engineers. And these young cats included Pat Kelly and the great Philip Smart, who worked with Toby for just two years before moving to New York in 1973 and would become one of the massive forces that would make the Big Apple among the first places in America to have its own reggae scene. Not to mention Prince Jammy, who had moved to Canada a few years before but would come back to Jamaica in 1976 to rejoin King Toby's studio and become his right-hand man. And by the end of the 70s, Toby would take on a teenage prodigy named Hopton Brown, aka Scientists, who like Toby would also become a legendary producer. It's almost impossible to list all the artists who got a massive boost from Toby's dub magic, but the likes of Johnny Clark, Delroy Wilson and Linval Thompson quickly come to mind. Toby's dub mixes are ubiquitous and too many to list. But I dare say that his most famous and signature dub masterpiece is the incredible track named King Toby Meets Rockers Uptown that featured Augustus Pablo, a phenomenal track that is dub 101. 
and was even listed as number 266 on Rolling Stone magazine's list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. This incredible track was powered by the bionic voice of Jacob Miller, the haunting melodica of Augustus Pablo, and the explosive drumming of Carlton Barrett. And I've left a link to this song in the description section for you to enjoy after watching this video. And in no time, producers like Lee Scratch Perry were creating their own dub versions and that time was spread all over Jamaica and eventually to reggae music producers all over the globe. And it became so popular, it solidified the sound status as a bona fide subgenre of reggae music alongside dancehall and lovers rock. By the early 1980s, King Tubby would build a state-of-the-art studio in his neighborhood in Waterhouse and became focused on building a dynasty with the young engineers that flocked to his establishment, all hoping to become the next Jammy or scientist. But sadly, around 1 a.m. on the 6th of February 1989, King Toby had just returned from his studio and was parked outside his home at Duhaney Park when he was approached by a lone gunman. That criminal took his cash, jewelry and licensed firearm before taking his life with a single shot. A terrible tragedy that left the reggae world and indeed Jamaica in shock and was another awful chapter in the violence epidemic which has claimed so many lives in Jamaica over the years. The killer was never found but I personally believe that it was somebody who knew his schedule. King Toby's death was a mortal blow to the reggae world as a man whose life was taken was indeed a genius and Jamaican institution that was loved by everybody. That killer took his life, but the subgenre of reggae music that he invented lives on big time and the impact of dub music on other genres like techno, house, hip hop and electronic dance music is truly immortal. He is no longer with us, but we will continue to hear the genius of King Toby until the end of time. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe and until next time, Jobless.